Margaret White is with Bank of America. I want to thank Bank of America for being second year Higher Ground sponsors. Woo! Thank you. Woo! So Margaret and I have known each other a few years. Uh, one of the other volunteer things that I do is I work with the Women in Cybersecurity Conference that is put on by Tennessee Tech and the National Science Foundation. And I had an opportunity to hear Margaret's presentation a few years ago, and I asked her if she would do this presentation. So before we get started, can I ask uh, GuidePoint? GuidePoint. Thank you. Without further ado, My Margaret White from Bank of America. Thank you, Kathleen. Thanks for having me today. I know you guys are probably already getting a little bit tired being the uh, afternoon already on day one, but I imagine that all of you who are in this room are here because you're interested, invested in your careers, wanting to know perhaps what you can do next, what you can do with what you've done and what you know, um, and maybe feeling a little overwhelmed by all the possibilities for what's out there. Um, so hopefully I can help you with that a little bit. Um, so I've been with Bank of America for 15 years. I'm an info security engineer um, in our operations side, which is a new role for me. I'm very new to SecOps. Um, kind of uncharted territory for me, but I'm one of a team of over 2,100 employees who serve to protect our more than 46,000 consumer and small business customers um, from the bad things that can happen to them and to their money. And these, these are the customers like you, each of you, and me. And our ability as individuals to take care of our livelihoods um, and to live our lives and do the things that we want to do. And so it's I'm very proud to be part of an organization that serves to protect us all of us who are here. Um, so that's a, a daunting task, um, but it's, it's been a, a long path, and I want to explain to you a little bit how I got to where I am, because I did not start on this path. I, uh, so growing up, um, my mother was a primary influence on me going into tech. She, she always talked about STEM, STEM, STEM. Um, so I had a lot of opportunities with camps and whatnot. I participated in Science Olympiad, even went to nationals four times as a kid, which I was kind of proud of and um, still very passionate about and excited about as far as an opportunity to introduce kids to STEM and get them interested in what the things are that they can do out there. Um, my mom was actually a physics major, and she worked in the um, semiconductor and aerospace industries. And her last role before she would retired was as a software engineer um, working on interface control systems for satellite uh, command software. <clears throat> so my, um, ultimately, I ended up majoring in computer science with a focus in software engineering. I didn't like hardware. I didn't like networks. And back then, that's where security was. So I was adamantly opposed to doing anything with security as well. I said, I want to I wanna build things. I want to make things go. That's what I was interested in. And you might wonder how I ended up at a bank of all places when I, I wanted to work in tech. Um, and that was just a matter of that period of time. Um, there weren't many entry-level jobs for computer scientists at that time. Most of my classmates were staying on for grad school and, and getting Department of Defense grants, and I knew I needed to pay my bills, I needed to pay my student loans, so I wanted to get out into industry as soon as possible. Um, and it just so happened that Bank of America was one of the companies that was recruiting on campuses then for technologists. Um, and I, uh, it was ironic, at first I, I turned down a couple of opportunities um, that were within our networking group, because I said, no, I, I really want to do software. Thankfully, my naive self got a phone call a few weeks later from a couple of guys named Dave that wanted to interview me and ultimately wanted to hire me. And at the time, I thought it was, would have been only slightly more ironic had it been two guys named Bob who had wanted to talk to me. And funny enough, one of my first roles working for these guys, my first week on the job, I was actually reading TPS reports, which are actually a real thing when you're doing performance testing of systems. So that was, that was kind of funny and ironic. I enjoyed that. Um, so, so starting out, I was involved in this uh, campus training program with 45 other um, campus graduates. We were on training together, got to learn all about corporate culture, working for a big company, being part of a financial services institution. 
um, and then started my job. I've been with the company now for 15 years, and I have had many, many different roles over that time. I've only been truly in security roles for the last four years. So sometimes I, I feel, as some of you may in your roles, and, and there was some talk about this this morning, there's some imposter syndrome once in a while related to that. But what I want to talk to you about, because I, I don't regret my career path, and that's because I have learned how to connect the dots between the things I've done, the things I've learned, and what that means from the security implications perspective. And that's what I want to talk to each of you a little bit about, is how to connect those dots for yourself, how to draw upon your own experiences, and how to connect that together. So the, the three things that we're going to consider are what we try to protect, why on earth we need to protect it, and how to actually protect it. Just three simple questions. So anything you work on, anything that you've done, you apply these points to that, and you can connect all the dots together on really how to be a successful security professional. So when you consider knowing what you're trying to protect, and this one is probably the most challenging for a whole lot of us. It's certainly the one that I most often have to remind myself of. And this is where it comes down to knowing something inside and out, knowing it intimately. Know what the business is. If you work in a security organization within a, a larger company, or even if you work for a company that solely focuses on security, you still need to know what on earth it is that you're trying to protect. Um, and so I talk a lot to college students and high school students about what to do with their, their educational paths and their career paths and what to look at. And I like to share a couple of basic examples related to that. Um, one is a friend of mine, Carla, who it, she's a, a prolific seller online of um, high-end clothing um, to the point where she actually, she qualifies to pay taxes on what she does with that. And she's an IT professional, full-time, day job, but this is something she does on the side. But if you, if you think about Carla as an individual, much like us, I mean, the, the things that we have to protect are who she is. Think about her identity, her, her authentication credentials for her online profiles, um, how she purchases the merchandise that she sells, how she purchases her own groceries and pays her bills and the things that she needs to do for her own li livelihood. Um, and then even her reputation as a seller online. If she's going to have an, an eBay profile or an Etsy shop, she needs to have a solid reputation in order to attract and keep more business, keep repeat customers, et cetera, and have people trust her with their, with their money for the goods that she's selling. A corporate example, um, and bear with me with this example, a corporate example would be a major motion picture studio. If you think about that for a moment, we know some examples. The, the things to think about from that perspective are, though, their business is their intellectual property. They have supply and demand related to creative projects that they put out there in the marketplace for entertainment. That is their what? That's their business. That's, that's their bread and butter, their livelihood. To do that, they have complex business operations. Um, they have to be able to have the, the technology infrastructure to support that the operations to be able to create these projects in the first place, the ability to do their distribution and their marketing and internal communications, paying their suppliers, paying their staff, a lot of complex business operations that go into that. And then the last part of that is reputation. For them to be able to continue that business of what they do, they need to be able to attract financing. They need to be able to attract top talent. They're not gonna be able to sell their movies if they don't have the biggest stars. And so they need to be able to do that. These are the examples of what we're trying to protect. If you think about the why, the why is all about knowing the worst case scenarios, of which, unfortunately, there are many, many examples in the security industry of worst case scenarios that happen to anybody, individual customers, corporate customers. So these worst case scenarios are the things that you want to prevent happening. So in Carla's example, clearly we don't want Carla to have a loss of income because she's no longer able to sell her merchandise online. Um, but then there's also the fact that she's doing online payments. There's the potential for fraud to be perpetrated against her. Um, she could suffer identity loss, which not only impacts her ability as an online seller, but that impacts her personally. Ultimately, it could affect her credit report, too. Not just her ability to spend funds, but if, if you get a bad credit report, that can impact your ability to get a job. So it has nothing to do with what she's doing online. It could affect the rest of her life as well. If if she were compromised, if worst case scenario came to fruition for her. Um, from the, the corporate example for a major motion, major motion picture company, 
we know what that can look like when worst case scenario happens. It's incredibly difficult to recover from. You, suffer, you can suffer huge financial losses for long periods of time simply because you've had a perfect storm, um, a, a tragedy of errors, if you will, when those things are aggregated together and are, are realized and compromised, um, which in this particular example, it impacts their ability to have a, a big demand for their intellectual property, for new movies coming out. If you don't have the anticipation anymore for a, a big blockbuster movie coming out, then how do you make money on it? It's not going to happen. Um, and also the potential to lose their investors and to lose the, the talent that they want to have be part of their projects. Um, long, long-term ramifications, ultimately, that can come from that. So when we go to the next point, so we've talked about the what with these couple of examples. We've talked about the why. And now we talk about the how. And the how is something that everybody who's here at B-Science, a lot of us do a really awesome job at the how. I mean, we, we have a whole lot of smart people in the industry who know exactly what to do, how to prevent these things, how to recover from these things, the entire kill chain. So, so there tends to be a laundry list of things that you apply to, to, to prevent and, and recover from any of these things happening and how to respond to them. Um, I mean, in Carla's example, use of multi-factor authentication would be a huge step for one thing that helps prevent a lot of those implications. Um, for the corporate example, I mean, better network protections are huge, obviously. Educating a company's employees about phishing is a huge step as well. And then email encryption, too, to protect uh, the reputation of individuals who represent that company. So to share my example and what I've done that helped me connect these dots, and hopefully this is an example that you can use in your own careers. So I look at every role I've had as being a different cog on the wheel. All these things that work together. And if you know what that, that next cog on the wheel is responsible for, the next one down, it teaches you more empathy um, for what those roles do. It helps you anticipate what they need from you and what you can do to contribute to those. Um, and, I, and I mentioned that I didn't want to do anything related to networking and security and that I wasn't interested in that back then because I was a little naive and had no idea that they were all interconnected. Um, but a, a couple of things about that. So you can see here kind of a list of, of some of the different experience I had. So I, I spent 11 years in our customer data space. So all the things that an individual customer like you and me does to interact with our finances with a company is where I, I spent my time for quite a number of years. Um, and so a couple of the examples here. Um, after I got done reading and creating TPS reports, I um, got into a role where I was doing database analysis. So we needed to be able to replatform our systems, to keep them scalable, to be able to do new things. I was very, so, so let me clarify. From a software engineering perspective, my bread and butter was SDLC. That is what I was focused on, was the entire life cycle for delivering new software. Security was the furthest thing from my mind. Um, so in this database analyst role, I built data dictionaries, figuring out how we were using our data, how it was flowing, so that we could build new, better, faster, more scalable systems, more reliable systems, have better data integrity, um, and and that was a really eye-opening experience. Um, but the and I put a note here about least privilege as well, because there was there was also part of that responsibility. I had to load new lists of values to our customer databases for for products and accounts. And there was an instance where I wiped out a pretty important table in our test environment um, that was used in our integrated testing and. I pretty much single-handedly brought down all integrated testing for individual customers um, by wiping out a table inadvertently because I had direct update access to the database. And uh, I messed up. It was a mistake. Thank goodness I was not in the production environment when I did that because it was the same script. It was the same commands. It was simply a different place to run my script. And I just as easily could have had that kind of impact in the production environment. And so even back then, um, there is a need to be protecting, protecting me from myself. Um, that, that's something that any of us who are part of a security organization inside a larger company, we're protecting us from ourselves in a lot of cases. Um, and, and that's just one of many examples. From there, I moved on to a role where I was an application design lead. So anytime we had technology projects where we were innovating, creative, creating new functions and products and services for our customers, um, I played a role in that, and one of my first projects, I was actually um, 
part of the project where we first rolled out security and fraud alerts to our customers. And in my mind, even though the project was called security and fraud alerts, I was not working in security. I was delivering software. I was delivering a project. And my role in that case actually was building out every single use case for every customer interaction um, with, the, with their bank accounts and with the company. And I had to think through every possible scenario of what a customer would do and build out the use cases, build out the functional test cases and test plans to be able to ensure that anytime a customer is doing something with their accounts that maybe somebody else could do in a nefarious way, we needed to be able to inform them and make sure that they knew what was going on with their accounts and with their, their online profile from a banking perspective. Um, so these were some of my early forays into security that I didn't even realize were going on in my head. But it, it, was, it was part of my day job. It was integrated into what I was doing. Um, and from there, I went into a number of, of other roles. But ultimately, they all revolved around knowing the data, knowing what it was doing, um, knowing how our customers needed to interact with us and how to take care of them and protect them, and eventually moved into an application manager role. So I, I, I told you how I worked on um, alerts and ultimately ended up managing that application. And even to this day, that functions in six million alerts every single day to our customers. So I told you we have more than 46 million individual uh, consumer and small business customers. We send them six million alerts every day. Now, those aren't just security and fraud alerts, but it's, it's event management. It's information about what they're doing, what their accounts are doing, what their transactions look like. Um, but managing that application um, included a lot of other roles. I had to keep the lights on with this application. We needed to ensure that, that we were delivering notifications to our customers, not just because it's nice to have and can pre prevent fraud for them, but also from a, a regulatory perspective. Some of these alerts include things like statement notifications. And there, there are laws that require customers to be given their, their banking statements. Um, and so that, that delves kind of into compliance requirements that we don't often talk about in the realm of security, but it's very closely related to security as well as risk. Um, so from a ri an operational risk perspective, I had to know how to recover my app. If there was a smoking hole in the grounds because the data center no longer existed, I had to have a plan for that. I had to know, hey, how are we going to get the system back up and running if the data center's out? Um, so how to recover for that, from that. And also implementing change. I told you my focus had always been SDLC. Well, how do you change systems that provide services to customers 24 by 7, how do you change those and touch those without impact? So being able to, to implement change without having negative impacts to the customers was a huge part of that. And this was a huge amount of overhead that I had as an application manager that every application manager has, and it um, especially working for a large company. There are a lot of rules you have to follow. There, there's a lot of governance. There's a lot of um, checkpoints to make sure that we're taking care of business. And that was a big part of my job. It, it took away from focus on innovating, and I was really having to focus on a lot of governance. But so were all my peers. And because of that overhead, I started to learn why we had to protect our system. So as I had these programs coming to me saying, hey, you, app manager, you have to do this, I had to learn why. I mean, partly just because I wanted to know why the heck I was spending time on it and why my team was spending time on it. But then. I was asked to take on a new role because there was so much of this overhead and we were repeating ourselves day in and day out. Um, we had 70 customer data applications to worry about at that time. And uh, so, so we said, hey, we, we need to have somebody who's running this stuff and making sure that we're keeping on top of security requirements and risk and compliance requirements. And my boss at the time, he actually, um, he raised his hand and he said, hey, you know what? Margaret is the process queen. Margaret always asks the painful questions. Why does it work that way? Why are we doing this? What happens if you do this? And so I moved into a role where I was overseeing that whole portfolio for all these applications. And, um, and trying to make us, like I say here, safer and more secure and more compliant and following the rules, but doing it in a way that made sense. You know, we, we have so little time. It's, it's precious to us. And we want to make sure that we're doing this in a way that makes sense. We still need to service our customers at the end of the day. They still need to be able to bank. We need to be able to deposit our paychecks, and we need to be able to pay our bills as individuals, right? So you want that protected. You certainly don't want anything happening to you as an individual customer of a bank that would impact your ability to do that. So 
So as I was doing this and trying to do this with my peers, I needed to be able to tell them the story. I needed to be able to explain the narrative. Why you have to do this? Why do you need to be PCI compliant? Why do you need to do ethical hacking on your application? What are all those things that could go wrong? So to learn more about that, I started going to conferences and talks and seminars to try and learn more. So I actually had, um, I had the opportunity to hear a couple of speakers early on in this sort of risk management role that kind of blew my mind. Um, one of them was a, a post-mortem of an industry event related to a, a very small ATM card processing company um, that resulted in the largest ATM drawdown in history at the time. And it was, it was really interesting to listen to the postmortem of this attack because they kind of told the, the chronology of what happened. And, and the first thing they talked about was that this company had grown through acquisition. So they struggled with asset management because they had data centers here, data centers here. They were, they were spread out geographically and physically. And that opened them up to having somebody being able to walk into a data center and plug into a machine and get on their network. Then what happened was with the, the proliferance of social media, I mean, if you're a software engineer, you want to brag about yourself on, on LinkedIn and talk about who you are and what your technical prowess is and what the cool things are you've worked on. From there, it was easy enough to social engineer their way into knowing who the developers were on those card systems to be able to send an email and say, hey, Joe, I'm working on this project, and I could really use those database schematics from you, if you don't mind sending that over to me. So sure enough, of course you're going to collaborate in that sort of environment and, and share that information. From there, they were able to get into the code repositories and change the code to remove the withdrawal limits on the ATM cards. From there, they were able to get into the database that had um, all the records for phone banking for this company's customers to call in and change their pens. Yeah, their pins weren't encrypted. Probably not a great idea. So when you think about worst case scenario, I mean, this isn't yet another, it's, it's a tragedy of errors. Perfect, perfect storm. You aggregate all these things together that on their own, they might not be a big deal. You might get to it eventually. You put those things together and you have a pretty crummy situation. So all that that I just described took place in two weeks. Two weeks time, that was it. And from there, that group spent an entire year creating counterfeit ATM cards and lining up people to stand at ATMs one Saturday morning all around the world and withdraw more than $4 million all at one time. I mean, it was, so listening to this example, this story, when somebody told this to me, I was, I was on the edge of my seat. I was like, holy crap, any of those things can happen at any company. I mean, that, it just, that's life. That's how big companies evolve, that's how complex technology evolves. There are all kinds of loopholes there that you could connect together and have bad things like that happen. And to me, I was like, oh my gosh, okay, I know all this, this what about banking technology. Now I have a really good example of why we need to be protecting it, because oh my gosh, I don't want that to ever happen any place where I'm working. A second example um, of something I heard, I had the opportunity once to hear Dan Gear speak. And he spoke about the trade-offs in cybersecurity. And if, if you haven't had the opportunity to speak, I highly recommend that you take a chance to look him up. Um, and when he talked about the trade-offs in cybersecurity, it was, a, it was kind of about the balance between convenience of the data that we have and harvest and gather and the trade-off, how, how to secure that, and finding that balance somewhere in between that you can still have that convenience with the data you have, but then not have those worst-case scenarios happen. And so when I heard him speak, he gave me goosebumps. I mean, I went home that night and I was like, okay, I think I just found a turn in my career path. I, I, I need to get into security because now that, now that I, I've spent my career learning about the what, I'm learning more and more about the why and it scares the heck out of me every time I hear another example of a worst case scenario. And then I said, well, what do I do? I need to learn how to protect us from these things. And that, that was kind of my next step. And so that, that evolution of knowing what that what was, so remember I said I was in a training program when I started at the company. Well, one of the guys who was in my training class, so this is like 11 years later, I call him up and I'm like, hey, John, how's it going? Caught up a little bit and I said, look, I've been getting more exposed to some of these things and I want to learn more. I feel like I need to learn more about how to protect things so that I can be 
better in my role in this technology organization because this is a big deal and this is scaring me and I want to be part of this. And we ended up, we actually, at the time, we were creating a role, a business information security or BISO role, um, a business information security officer that was kind of new in the industry at that time. There weren't many. And really the goal was to be a security evangelist to the technology organizations, to be able to take these stories, these worst case scenarios, and apply it in context around the what to help influence my, my colleagues on, you know, hey, I understand your business. I understand that this is what you do. Here's why you need to be protecting it. And hey, look, I have this team of more than 2,100 of my teammates who could come and tell you how to protect it and help you protect it. Let me help you. And so, so I, I moved into that role in our security organization. Um, and what was interesting was I was not phasing off with the organization I'd come from, which supported individual customers. I was now supporting a technology organization that worked with corporate clients. So I had to be able to connect the dots and figure out, well, how does what I did before apply to this business context and connect the dots between that? But I, and I also had to be able to convince these other app managers who worked on totally different systems. I had to convince them of the same thing that I'd convinced my peers of years earlier. And by walking in and, and some of the first conversations I, I had with these tech execs, my business partners, to sit down and gain some credibility with them, I said, look, your app managers have the hardest job in the world. They have the hardest job in the company. That I, I get it, I've been there. We're asking them to do so much that it, it, it almost, it can paralyze them if we don't work together in a smart way to do it. Um, and that helped give me credibility because they understood that I'd been in their shoes. And that helped them listen to me when I said, listen, you got to hear about this, this story, this worst case scenario that, that we've heard about. And so working with other teams within cybersecurity, it helped be able to tell those narratives. So, so what I ended up, and so I mentioned at the beginning, I'm, I'm new to SecOps as well. So recently I moved into yet a new role um, within our operations team. Um, so cybersecurity defense, if you will, and, and my role there, I'm overseeing a, a transformation program that's taking a look at our existing operational processes from a security perspective and breaking those down in, into the processes, the nuts and bolts. What are we doing? How can we do it better? How can we anticipate what the, the future threat landscape is going to look like so that we can be better, smarter, faster? And so while I'm new to SecOps and I, I haven't worked in that, the experiences I've had in the past, so the ability to take a process or a system and deconstruct it and understand the nuts and bolts, it's directly applicable. The time I spent as an app manager keeping the lights on, so working production incidents, working overnight to deploy change without impact, um, those, those were all directly relevant to the SecOps world as well and being able to relate to my teammates in that space and understand their processes too. So, so I tell you all of this because, what I want to reassure you of is you can look at your own experience and your future experiences. It's a matter of looking at those ways that it ties together, connecting those dots and looking at that, that context. So as we do like resume reviews and career coaching here over the next couple of days, I encourage you to consider how to draw on your past experience um, and how to connect those things together because it, they really are connected and they all lead to cybersecurity. You may even find that it makes sense to take a step out of a security organization and do something with a security lens out in the business to be able to understand the what and then apply those three things together and see how the, the what, why, and how tie together. Um, and the other thing that, that comes after that is really the when and where. We operate very much in a, we must protect all the things all the time, everywhere that's not necessarily scalable or sustainable. So the next step with that is really to think about how can we provide the, the optimum protection from a security perspective and work smarter um, and be able to do that. And as we look at the tools that continue to evolve to help us do that, I mean, uh, the MITRE attack framework is a great example that helps give us an, uh, an inventory and a matrix of, hey, these are the bad things that can happen in this context. Here are the things you do to protect it. Here's how you protect it and it can help us work smarter, better, faster from a, a security perspective. Thank you for your time. <laughs>